Welcome to today's Cancer Chatters webinar, Clinical Trials, Cancer Clinical Trials, the what, the how, and the why. My name is Melissa Ledger. I'm the Director of Cancer Prevention and Research at Cancer Council Western Australia. It's great to have you here and uh, to hear our wonderful guest speaker, who I'll, I'll, I'll introduce in just a few moments. Before I do that, as part of our ongoing commitment to our Reconciliation Action Plan, as an important part of National Reconciliation Week, I would like to acknowledge the country where I'm sitting today. And so in the spirit of deepening relationships, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and owners of the country where I'm sitting today and the country where you might be, and the traditional custodians and the countries where you may be joining us today. For me, that's the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation. I'd like to recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community. And I also pay my respect to their elders past and present and respect, extend that respect to Aboriginal people who are joining us today. As I say, we're really fortunate to have a remarkable guest speaker with us today for our Cancer Chatters. And it's so fabulous to have a, a webinar forum for it because it means we can have such great speakers join us. We will encourage you to ask questions as we go today. We have the question and answer function on the bottom of your screen, I hope, that's Q and A. Please type your questions in there throughout the lecture so that we can respond to those at the very end. We've got time for questions at the end. So we've also got an online evaluation survey and we'll send that around after the event. We really ask you to please complete that for us. Please tell us what you thought of today, but also what you'd like to see for future cancer updates as well. It really is invaluable information for us. So thank you for that. And then this afternoon, our speaker is Professor Michael Millwood, who has been a remarkable uh, clinician in Western Australia and lifted the pro profile of clinical trials uh, incredibly high. Uh, for us and for our state. And so we're grateful for that. But we're also really grateful for the time Professor Millwood gives us and um, provides information back to the community through events such as this. So we're always very grateful and um, thankful for Professor Millwood's support. So Professor Millwood is a physician researcher trained in cancer medicine. He is the Foundation Professor Chair of Clinical Cancer Research at the University of Western Australia and Oncology Clinical Trials Lead at Linear Clinical Trials Research Perth in Western Australia. Michael is the WA Lead on multiple clinical trials, national trials groups, and research initiatives, including the Australian Genomic Cancer Medicine Centre and Australia's National Cancer Molecular Testing Study. It's really such a great pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Millwood to give us today's Cancer Chatters talk. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Melissa. Uh, and again, uh, I would like to also share my acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the land upon which uh, I am presenting, which is uh, the Wajuk Nyunga families. And I acknowledge uh, any members who may be present. Uh, I'd like to thank firstly the Cancer Council uh, for inviting me to uh, speak uh, this afternoon and to acknowledge their uh, long-standing support. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you uh, for uh, tuning into this webinar, uh, and I hope you find it uh, uh, of interest to you. Uh, I'll now start uh, screen sharing. Okay, uh, so I've been asked to talk about cancer clinical trials, the what, the how, and the why. Uh, and as uh, Melissa said, uh, I'm a medical oncologist and an academic based at uh, the University of Western Australia. I have an adjunct appointment at Edith Cowan University, and I currently conduct uh, uh, cancer clinical trials uh, through linear clinical research. Uh, as a uh, medical oncologist and clinical trialist, I have a number of uh, interactions uh, with pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and uh, I list them there uh, in the spirit of open disclosure. So what do we mean by cancer clinical trials? What, what are they? Uh, well, at a, at a basic level, 
uh, a cancer clinical trial is doing anything in the care of a cancer patient uh, that is not what we might term normal care, routine practice, uh, or standard care. Uh, now, this might be uh, seeing what effect a new type of medication has. Uh, and I put that in bold because that's the sort of clinical trial that I principally do. And I think it's what most people understand when they use the term cancer clinical trial. But a cancer clinical trial may be uh, a number of other things as well. It might involve testing a new type of radiation or surgery or other type of cancer care. Uh, it might involve doing additional tests on samples taken from people with cancer, such as tumor biopsies or blood samples to learn more about cancer and try and predict what types of uh, routine or standard care will give better outcomes in some patients. And a cancer clinical trial can evaluate other things such as exercise programs, meditation, nutritional interventions. And these are equally important areas of cancer clinical trial. Uh, then there are some areas which I call gray areas, uh, which most people don't consider to be cancer clinical trials, including things like audits of treatment, uh, outcomes of cancer treatment in broad populations, and epidemiological research. Uh, and generally, these latter groups are considered what might be termed no or minimal risk research uh, and generally don't require specific approval individually for participants by an ethics committee. Now, I'm going to use the term here participant to refer to somebody who is involved as a participant in a cancer clinical trial. Uh, we used to use the term patients, which is still quite widely used and in many cases is appropriate because the large majority of participants are patients and we certainly very, very rarely do testing of cancer treatments on people who don't have cancer. Uh, often the term subjects is used. I, I don't particularly like this term. Uh, subjects seems a little bit like there's a, a ruler and a subject, uh, whereas participant emphasizes the active participation of that person and their involvement in the process, not just as somebody who is having something done to them, but as someone who is actively involved in the advancement of cancer treatment. So I'll try and use the term participant uh, rather than patient. Uh, all cancer clinical trials uh, have some things in common, and I've listed them there. Uh, there's a written document that we refer to as a protocol uh, that is written in advance of any participation uh, by any participant and lays out what the hypothesis is, what is actually going to be tested, what types of participants will be recruited into the trial, how many, how long will it take, what types of assessments will be done. All cancer clinical trials also have a process uh, whereby the participant is provided with written information and indicates willingness to participate, a process we termed informed consent. In certain situations, uh, particularly lower risk research, consent may be delivered uh, in what's called an implied way. In other words, by willingness to complete a questionnaire and return it implies that a participant uh, agrees to do so. However, for most of the trials that I do uh, and what are considered generally cancer clinical trials, informed consent is done in writing. That doesn't mean, as we'll see, that the participant has to be physically present. Uh, the protocol and informed consent documents and information about who is going to do the trial, what are termed the investigators, where the trial is going to be done, what's referred to as the institution, and how the trial will be done is submitted to and approved by a human research ethics committee. Uh, in many, many cancer clinical trials, 
Uh, there are many investigators, often at several institutions. Cancer clinical trials have a process to collect and analyze the data to determine the results of the trials. And they will have a registration on a uh, international or national database that is publicly available. Uh, so you can go online and find out all the cancer clinical trials that are being done. Indeed, all the trials across all areas in medicine. Uh, the trial site I've listed there is a US-based site and is the largest and most comprehensive. And you can go on there and you can search by locations, you can search by diseases, you can search by specific types of drugs and procedures uh, and uh, find out what uh, clinical trials are being done. Uh, as a tip, uh, if you do this, uh, most of the data that's collected for site refers to things like suburb. So don't just type in Perth because you will only get something that's in the suburb of Perth. Type in Netherlands or anywhere else where uh, a hospital is and see if you can find something there. Now, getting back to what I do, the what I call cancer drug clinical trials. In other words, where we're trying out new drug treatments for cancer. Uh, we really divide these now into what are called early phase and late phase. Uh, you may have heard in the past terms like phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. Uh, we tend not to use those terms now. Uh, early phase, uh, which I guess in the past was what we meant more by phase one and a bit of phase two, uh, is there to determine the best dose of a new drug, what the potential side effects are, how quickly the drug is excreted or metabolized in the body, the best schedule, and by schedule I mean things like if the drug's a tablet, is it best to have it once a day or twice a day, if it's an infusion, is it best to give it once a week or once every three weeks? Uh, and what effect the drug has on the size and activity of cancer in participants as evaluated by scans or PET scans and whether any blood tests can predict patients who are going to do well or not well, what we term a biomarker. And ultimately the results of an early phase trial will determine whether the drug is taken to the next stage. And importantly, in an early phase trial, all the participants will receive the drug uh, being studied. I'm sorry, there's a typo there. Uh, late phase trials, or what we used to term uh, some phase two and phase three, and perhaps a bit of phase four, uh, where a new treatment is compared to a standard treatment. Uh, and that is done by a process of randomization part of where participants are randomly allocated to receive either the standard treatment or the new treatment. Uh, and this can be done in what's termed a blinded way in which the participant and the investigator is unaware of which treatment the patient is having at least while they're having it. And the results of effectiveness and safety will be compared between those receiving the standard treatment uh, and the new treatment. Uh, increasingly in cancer late phase trials, what are termed participant reported outcomes are evaluated. So participation, uh, participants are asked to regularly report their symptoms uh, and complete quality of life questionnaires and other assessments. In a late phase trial, at least some of the participants will not receive the drug being studied, but will have the standard uh, treatment. And the results of these late phase trials are used uh, to have new treatments approved in Australia uh, and uh, in Australia funded. Um, I don't know how well you can see this slide, but at around uh, the human figures in the middle, uh, are lots of circles, which are all different types of cancer, and leading into these circles are the names of new drugs uh, that have been approved, in this case in the US, uh, over a, a five-year period, 2015 to 2019. 
Uh, and you can see there's lots and lots and lots of them. So as a result of our early and late phase trials, many, many new treatments are becoming available. I'm sure you've heard of many of these new drugs. They include immune drugs, targeted drugs, cellular therapies, novel hormonal treatments, and many others. So what are the benefits and risks? Uh, I'm gonna talk really about the early phase trials because uh, the risks and the benefit apply to a lesser extent to the later phase trials. So for earlier phase trials, well, the participant will get a new treatment. It will have shown promising results in experimental tests. Uh, and uh, that participant directly will be providing important information that will benefit cancer patients and the community in the future. Uh, and I'm continually amazed in the work that I do, you know, how generous, how altruistic, how meaningful it is to many participants to say, look, it may not help me, but I'm doing something that I can do uh, to help others who may be in my position in the future. And I only, can only take my hat off to people uh, and their generosity. If you're on a cancer clinical trial, uh, as well as the usual uh, doctors, nurses, and other staff, there are dedicated clinical trial staff who will coordinate things, uh, be available to answer questions, and act as an additional resource. And not unimportantly in this time of um, financial toxicity for cancer patients, uh, treatment tests and scans required for trials are provided free. Uh, on the downside, side effects can occur. Uh, and because drugs in early phase trials have not been studied in that many people, the precise rate and severity of side effects are often not known. Uh, importantly, when considering a clinical trial compared to standard treatment, there will be more visits. There will be more blood and other tests. Sometimes biopsies will be taken. There's more of a time commitment and there's likely travel and care at a new place. So there's, a, there's an impact that is not measurable just in terms of side effects, but in terms of impact on that person's life uh, and what they're otherwise able to do. And that's an important consideration for many participants. And we try and make it as easy as we can, make it as well coordinated as possible but it is a commitment. It's important to know that a cancer clinical trial uh, is not like a legal contract. Anyone can withdraw from it at any time uh, for any reason. So when to ask about a clinical trial? Uh, these are some suggestions that I have, and I think they're reasonable. If you're diagnosed with a rare cancer, Ask from the beginning, am I going to be suitable for a clinical trial? Because we know less about rare cancers and we're more reliant on trials to provide access to treatments and potential answers. If the outcome with current standard treatment is not that good, if the current standard treatment stops working, ask before the cancer causes severe symptoms or problems because patients, uh, sorry, participants on clinical trials are generally required to be reasonably fit and well. And keep asking, because new clinical trials start all the time. And if a trial is not possible when a cancer is diagnosed, that doesn't mean it's not gonna be possible in 12, 24 months time. And who to ask? Obviously your medical oncologist, other cancer specialists that are looking after you. Cancer nurse coordinators and cancer support groups are often good sources of information. COVID has had a substantial impact on cancer clinical trials and continues to do so. Uh, in the US and Europe, uh, many institutions stopped cancer trials altogether, closed down their clinical trials unit and deployed their staff to the COVID front line. Many more, including in the Eastern States, at least stopped offering trial to new patients 
and globally clinical trial activity fell by more than 60%. New trials were delayed and the prior prioritization for many uh, drug companies and funders uh, pivoted from cancer to vaccines and infectious diseases. We escaped the worst, but uh, we have persistent COVID effects now. Uh, staff off work, lack of overseas immigrants, disruptions to supply chains, and general system overload throughout the health sector. However, we are still going. We have not seen a substantial drop, as I'll show you, and clinical trials continue to be developed and offered to participants. COVID has given us some good changes. Um, we've made increasing use of telehealth, teleconsenting, where patients can discuss the trial over the phone and indicate their uh, consent by uh, scanning and returning documents or using electronic document signing rather than physically having to come. Uh, delivery of drugs, such as oral drugs, to patients directly rather than them having to come to site and in some circumstances, treatment off-site. Uh, work patterns and flexibility have changed, which have been a good thing for our staff. And I think in the long run, we will benefit because we have been less impacted than elsewhere. And we've been particularly uh, rapid in our responses and our ability to engage uh, trials in the COVID times. Uh, so this is just some pictures of um, uh, the linear cancer trials units uh, with all the staff. You can see me in the middle there. Uh, just look for the oldest person there and you'll find me. Uh, this is a graph of our activity. So uh, if you look in the black, which is 2020 around March, uh, which is when COVID hit, uh, you can see there was a slight fall in activity over the subsequent two months, but it rapidly recovered and uh, 2021 uh, continued the upward trend uh, in activity. Uh, the number of patients enrolled on trials has continued to increase, as you can see here. Uh, and in the last uh, couple of slides, I'm just going to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities uh, that we face. Um, despite what I've said, despite the potential benefits of cancer clinical trials, only a minority of cancer patients become participants in cancer clinical trials. Uh, and that figure is variable, but it's certainly not more than about 10%. Uh, however, we do know that at least half of cancer patients who are approached about participating in a trial are at least willing to consider it. So the reason that a minority of cancer patients become participants uh, is not because most cancer patients uh, are not willing uh, to do so. It's because we don't have enough trials. It's because we don't have a broad spectrum of trials that covers uh, all types of cancers. Uh, and increasingly, uh, research is telling us uh, from particularly the US, but also Europe and Australia, uh, that some groups are underrepresented in cancer clinical trials. These include ethnic minorities, indigenous populations, non-English speaking persons, and persons of low income. And we know that these are groups that not only are underrepresented in clinical trials, they're groups who have a higher incidence and higher severity of cancer uh, than people who are not in these groups. Uh, even when differential access to healthcare is considered, uh, these groups are underrepresented and there will be a big focus in years to come in improving participation uh, of uh, uh, minority groups in clinical trials uh, for cancer uh, led by the US but becoming worldwide. And we need a whole health sector approach, uh, including academic sectors in the community to hopefully address this. In an opportunity side, we have to see cancer clinical trials as more than just what I've described to you. Yes, it's very important for improving outcomes for cancer patients. It's very important for the engagement of the whole community 
uh, to support and participate where patients can. But we have to see cancer clinical trials uh, in a different sense as well. Cancer clinical trials will develop and attract academic, scientific and other leaders. And as you can see from the photo, cancer clinical trials employs a lot of people. It's an industry, it brings jobs, it brings money, it brings intellect, and it's smart business for Western Australia to try and develop it, not just in cancer, but across medicine in general. Uh, I'd like to thank people at Linear, and I'll stop there. And if there's questions, I'll stop screen sharing and um, I'm happy to discuss any. We do have a few questions, Michael. And we'll start with, um, someone's just saying thank you to start with, but we'll launch straight into the questions. If people are receiving one intervention in the trial respond much better than the people receiving the other intervention or standard care, will the participants receiving standard care be given access to the more effective intervention once the trials are over? A great question. Um, Yes, in some circumstances that does occur. It depends a little bit on the phase of the trial uh, and how long it takes to get the results from the trial. Sometimes in the later phase trial, it can take quite some time after the, pay, uh, the participants receive treatment to know if the new treatment will actually be any better. Uh, but there are certainly in earlier phase trials, uh, yes, there will be changes made based on the results of the trial so that patients, even if not receiving the optimal dose or the optimal schedule, can uh, have their treatment changed. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. Uh, what about if uh, one of the questions here is, will people be paid to participate in trials Will their expenses be covered, you know, travel or parking? And how long, and, and you've really answered that last part, I think, around how long um, it takes before the results of the trials are known. So you've actually answered that bit, apologies. So just really around the costs. Yeah, that's a great question too, and thanks for asking it. Um, so generally in cancer clinical trials where the participants are people with cancer, uh, the participants will not be paid in the sense of being paid just for participation. However, expenses for things like travel, parking, etc., uh, may be covered. Uh, so, yes, ask about that. Um, so, yes, if we draw that sort of distinction between expense reimbursement and actually being paid as if you know you're a <laughs> you've got a job then uh, there is a difference and yes it varies from trial to trial it depends who the sponsors are uh, often if it's being funded through government grants and things then there isn't that funding but if it's being funded from a pharmaceutical company often there is at least some expense reimbursement. Excellent, thanks Michael. We've got a few minutes, it's one o'clock now, but I've got a few more questions that I think would be really useful to answer if that's okay. Sure, I'm question... happy to continue for a few more minutes if you would Great. like. Thanks Michael. So this is a question around um, drug, drugs that you'll be on, on a clinical trial. Uh, sound like they're probably intravenously given in this particular question. And the question is, um, in time, do those drugs then become available in a pill form so that they don't have to be um, given intravenously? So they're on a trial for two drugs, um, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce them. It's just too difficult. Um, and they've been on those for 18 months. And the question really is, do these then become tablet form? Um, that would be quite unlikely. Generally, if a, if a cancer drug has to be given intravenously, uh, it's because it's something like an antibody or a large molecule that can't be absorbed you know, through the bowel in the way that small molecules that make up most of our tablets are. Uh, so it's very unusual to see a cancer drug that can be given intravenously 
as well as orally. Where that does occur, it's usually something that you can give orally, but has been developed to give it intravenously uh, for various reasons, including patients who are not able to take oral things. Uh, so yeah, I, I can't promise that that will occur. Yeah, interesting. Do you, do you have some advice for people trying to find clinical trials specifically to their cancer type? You know, if they've got colorectal cancer, for example, is there somewhere they could go to, um, to see what's open and what might be eligible so that they can discuss it with their oncologist or other healthcare professional? Uh, so my advice is first, you know, discuss and ask your oncologist and healthcare professional, what do they know, what trials are available in the place that they work, uh, or what trials do they know is happening in other places uh, in Western Australia. Uh, and then search one of the clinical trial websites, including the one that I listed there. There's another one in Australia. I didn't put the address up. It's called the Australian Clinical Trials Registry. Uh, and you can find uh, information on many public websites uh, for cancer. Uh, and uh, if, if, you, if you Google something like what clinical trials are available for colorectal cancer in Western Australia, you will also get links to some as well. Right, and important for people to just to make sure they've got a reputable site. Uh, as you say, Cancer Australia have a great site and then the other one you've given, and we'll put those on our website with this presentation for people to be able to find those sites a bit more easily. We did have a few more questions and that was around clinical trials that might be in another country like the US. Do they automatically come to Australia as well for clinical trials here? And um, what sort of process do they we need to go through if a drug is found to be effective in a clinical trial in the US? Does that automatically mean it will be available in Australia? Have you got a quick answer for that? Because we're now quite well over. Um, uh, I don't have a quick answer, but I'll, I'll try and uh, give as quick an answer as I can. Firstly, um, clinical trials are done in all parts of the world. Uh, and different clinical trials are available in different countries and different places within countries. Uh, and clinical trials, it's something I always advise people to see what's available close to home for you, rather than consider traveling extremely long distances. Now, you know, in the last few years, that's been impossible, but it's now become possible again. Uh, so we are starting to see more questions like that. <coughs> if a trial is effective and the trial is done in the US uh, and that drug is approved in the US, uh, it should eventually become available and approved in Australia, although not necessarily immediately. Uh, but it may well become available for clinical trial use in Australia. So keep uh, asking around. Um, I don't generally advise patients to go to uh, the US to try and participate in trials unless they have extensive supports there or they have a particularly rare and unusual condition uh, because um, in general, uh, clinical trials in the US uh, are not as available as they are in Australia to people who are you know, unable to the US rates for care. It's a slightly more different system. Thank you very much, Michael. It's always great to hear you presenting on cancer clinical trials and you've got so much information to share with us and half an hour just isn't long enough. So we might have to get you back for some more detailed uh, conversations around clinical trials in the future. So thank you once again, Professor Michael Millward. Really really uh, enjoyable presentation today. And for those people who are still online with us, please don't forget to fill in your evaluation when we email that through to you. So thank you for joining us for Cancer Chatters and we hope to see you at our next Cancer Chatters soon. Thank you, Melissa.